economics. Oh, I was um, actually, um, I was a bit of a rebel when I graduated from college. I was a math student in the 1960s, graduated in 1970, and decided uh, to you know, go try my hand at various things in San Francisco, and uh, eventually went to grad school in uh, intending just to get a business degree, just to earn a living. And I came across the work of um, William Vickery, um, who had written an article in 1961 about auctions, and it was startling to me to see mathematics used to characterize you know, human behavior and how a social mechanism would work. And, um, I started reading more and I got really very excited because it was completely outside of anything I expected to be possible and I guess that was my first inspiration. The faculty at Stanford where I was studying was were um, sort of saw what was happening to me and encouraged me along, uh, called me in and told me I was in the wrong program, I should switch into a doctoral program and, and begin doing research. And I thought about it and thought, you know, to work on stuff I'm really interested in that I really love doing, that was exciting. So that's how I got going. I remember when my parents bought me a chemistry set. Um, they're very simple things, you know. Maybe it was, it was probably something as simple as, as, you know, vinegar and baking soda. I don't remember exactly. But just the idea that you could create a reaction that way, that was pretty exciting. And, Well, I get to work on um, things that I think are important and that I find interesting, and I have the freedom to, in my particular case, both to do research in these areas and actually to take the uh, my de ideas out and put them into practice in the world. The lecture I'm going to give today about radio spectrum policy, my ideas influenced uh, the first uh, you know radio spectrum auctions to allocate spectrum efficiently in the United States 15, 16 years ago, 17 years ago, and. Uh, to, to work on what I want and, and what excites me. In this case, it comes from William Vickery, whose, <laughs> whose work was on auctions that excited me, and, uh, and carry that forward and invent new things and have them work. Very exciting. Oh my goodness, you have to put, be able to put up with disappointments. There's so many failures. The, the, um, you know, whether you're doing experimental work or theoretical work or whatever you're doing, you, you bang your head against, uh, if, if, you're, if you're really challenging yourself and you're banging your head against a hard problem for a long time, um, sometimes I have to, you know, put the thing I'm most interested in in the back burner and do other things for, for a while, but you, you, have to, you have to stick with it. You have to be patient. So you have to be able to put up with, uh, with failures along the way to success. Well, I'm going to be talking today in the, in the lecture I, I give here about um, radio spectrum policy um, will be um, as a result of the kinds of inventions I'll be talking about. We'll be able to use radio spectrum better to raise revenue for the federal government to help, uh, to help mitigate the deficit, um, to improve competition in the industry by allocating things well. There's, there's a whole series of benefits that come from, from using radio spectrum well, and I think that's... Uh, uh, the most immediate benefits of my research. Of course, my students also, I love teaching too, and, I, the, and being able to, um, to understand the economy more deeply and be able to transmit that knowledge to my students at Stanford, that's fantastic. Well, it's actually not the person I named. William Vickery was sort of first, and he was big, uh, for sure. But actually, a colleague of mine, um, at Northwestern University during my first job, Roger Meyerson, who's also a Nobel laureate, um, is just a font of ideas and also uh, and an inspiration and also a challenge to me personally because you know we were we were young professors together and and I wanted to be as effective as Roger um, and he influenced my thinking and and my work habits and uh, and it was a constant inspiration. So I I named Roger Meyerson, I think. I think a lot of my colleagues even would be surprised at the degree to which um, uh, I have been able and the people around me have been able to use microeconomic theory and put it into direct practice. I think most um, uh, economists think that it's the applied researchers, the people who are doing the empirical work, 
that are estimating the effects of taxes or the effects of various policies that are most important for, for creating influential policy. But the idea that you can take pure theory and design new ways of you know, running economic mechanisms uh, from that, running auctions, for example, from that, uh, I think would surprise not only uh, uh, people in the general public, people like I was before I studied this, but even uh, many of my colleagues within economics. It's got to be uh, the photograph of the night my wife and I met. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, it's uh, as simple as that. We actually met at the 1996 Nobel Prize dinner and um, were there with, uh, with James Mirleys, who was one of the laureates that year. Um, that's, uh, that's sitting right in the center of my desk, and um, uh, that's the first thing. Well, that's actually easy. My, my son is a musician. Um, he plays the bass. He plays jazz. He has a hip-hop group as well. And uh, if, uh, while I often play old music and I play the Beatles and stuff, the thing I play most often is uh, the, the, my son's jazz or his Star People, which is his, his hip-hop uh, band's uh, album. The, um, that's what I listen to most frequently.